So thank you so much for having me to your Kiwanis meeting. My name is Sarah Maniscalco Robinson. You have to excuse me for my uniform for the day. I got dressed to go to Camp Dodge, but I'm not here as a member of the Iowa National Guard. I am here as a nonprofit owner, the Iowa Veterans Perspective. Um, I just happen to be working today, and this is what I'm doing over my lunch hour in my free time. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Never apologize for wearing the uniform. Thank you, thank you. However, legally, I have to say that because I cannot represent a nonprofit while in uniform. <laughs> <laughs> many, many lawyers have taught me what I can and cannot say while in uniform. Our lawyer's not here tonight. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, but, again, thank you so much for having me. I started the Iowa Veterans Perspective probably back when I enlisted in the military in 1997 because that's when I started telling stories. And I really developed a love for the stories, not just the people that tell the stories, but also what they can teach us about history and preserving history because the the way that they tell the stories just like we were talking about people people that are associated with history are the ones that help keep our history alive who better to tell our stories than the people that actually were there and lived it and experienced it so in 2007 i started recording what they call an oral history for the iowa gold star military museum on camp dodge has anyone been out to Camp Dodge and seen the museum? All right. Well, if you've been out there and watched one of their videos, I bet I probably made it. I make a lot of their videos for them. And that's how I got into really wanting to interview more veterans. Then, through the museum's support, I decided to, f uh, I founded the Iowa Veterans Perspective. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. But that way, I can continue to record the stories. I can donate them to the museum. They can use them for whatever they like. But then as a 501c3, I can also donate them to the Library of Congress. I can have volunteers to help with the, the project. Uh, Johnston students can do their silver cord hours and help me learn how to do the interviews. So this isn't just a Sarah Robinson project or an Iowa Gold Star Military Museum project. This is a Iowa project. So what I'm going to do, instead of sit up here and talk to you about, guys about what the Iowa Veterans Perspective is, I'm going to show you a video. Because if a picture says a thousand words, a video is going to tell you a whole story. So I'm going to go ahead and play this video, which says pretty much, so, Sarah, what is the Iowa Veterans Perspective? I'm Sarah Maniscalco Robinson, and this is the Veterans Perspective. You've been at this before. Yes, yes, that's true. So that explains a little bit more about what we do at the Iowa Veterans Perspective, but it also Catherine Strail was the high school senior that used to work here. I'm going to tell you a story about her. When she volunteered for her silver cord hours through Johnston High School, she asked me if she could, she had a, a, a long list of things that she wanted. One of them, she wanted to meet a Korean War veteran, a Marine specifically. And I thought, well, that's a very specific request. And she said, well, my grandpa was a Marine in Korea and he passed away before I could meet him. So she asked if she could meet someone and I said, oh, I've got somebody for you. So I introduced her to Bob Gates, who volunteers out at the museum. During their interview, you saw she was looking at pictures and learning about the uh, Korean War. And he gave her something called a challenge coin. Has anyone, does anyone know what a challenge coin is? Uh, let's see. This was my first challenge coin. I keep it in my pocket every day. See, it's a good thing I'm wearing my uniform. Yeah. This is the first challenge coin I got in 1999, and I still carry it with me. So the point is, you get a challenge coin uh, for doing a good job. Well, Bob gave her one that day. I came to Greenbrier probably about a year later, and she, yeah, I said, hey, Catherine, do you remember me? She's like, yeah, I remember you, and I remember Bob. And she had that coin in her pocket 
from a year later because the interview meant so much to her and she often uh, she would write me testimonials and stuff and she said she learned more in that one hour sitting down with a veteran than she ever learned in a history book at school so it's the interactive aspect and I always try to get young people involved the, the older generation and the younger generation are often cast aside because, oh, well, you're too young, you wouldn't understand. You're too old, your, your knowledge is obsolete. But you put those two together and something quite magical happens. The curiosity of the young people comes out and the knowledge of the more seasoned individual also has an opportunity to come out. That's what happens when my computer goes to sleep. It go, it'll go to blue. Catherine, Catherine has volunteered at our. Uh, oh, she's she is a great kid. She yeah, she is so great. So today I'm going to teach you guys a little bit about some things that I've noticed over time while doing these interviews. I'm estimating I've probably interviewed over 500 veterans and submitted them to the Library of Congress for historical preservation. They just recently had their, I believe it was their 25th anniversary at the Veteran History Project out at Library of Congress. They called me and asked if I would be a panel member for the nation on how to do this. Um, and of course I was, I was more than obliged, it was an online thing, but I still have an, an amazing relationship where as soon as Library of Congress opens their doors again, I'm going to have another bucket of interviews all filled out, all the paperwork filled out to be able to put there for historical preservation. Because what's the point in doing all these interviews if we don't preserve them? So one thing that I noticed as I was going through my interviews is there's two specific times in our nation's history where there were literally lines at the recruiting centers. And then I also started noticing the terms that they were using and the emotions they were feeling were also similar. And I think anyone who joins the military, whether you enlist or you are drafted, has a calling, like a call to service is what I call it. I'm going to play you the next video, and it discusses two times in our nation's history where many people had a call to service. I'm not sure how people hadn't put this type of video together in the past because the, the similarities are insane. They're almost interchangeable. The way that people talk about September 11th in my generation and the way that people talk about the bombings at Pearl Harbor in the World War II generation. Um, it kind of inspires the ideal. I don't know if you guys have ever seen on social media, there's a poem that goes around uh, about September 12th. The patriotism that everyone had on that day is somewhat lost to this current generation. We're about to have the 20th anniversary of September 11th, and a lot of Americans don't realize that we are still at war. So that's something to think about. We, there is an entire generation that is at war that since the day they were born, we have been fighting this. So it's something to think about, the, difference, the differences and similarities between the two times. But then I also want to talk to you guys a little bit about, uh, do we have any middle children here tonight? Middle children? Okay. What war do you think is sometimes considered the middle child and the forgotten veterans? Korea. World War II, big. Everybody was involved. Turned around, their little brothers and sisters went to Korea. Turned around, big. Vietnam, everybody knew about it. Korea somewhat happened and I want to show you guys the video that Catherine made with Bob Gates where he talks about it being the Forgotten War because they're kind of that one and usually when I say who's the Forgotten One nobody remembers and I'm like ah, that's my exact point people forget about the Korean War veterans but it was it was a big deal at the time for them are you saying that middle children are forgotten? Yes. <laughs> because my sister says that's why I turned out normal. My mom forgot me. 
It, <laughs> yes, because the youngest is the baby, so they're baby. The oldest is like, you know, the one that was back when the parents still had energy. <laughs> I'm the youngest. By the time they got to me, my mom had given up. <laughs> Let's find Bob Gates. So this is the video that Catherine Strail and I worked together to create. And if you're not careful, you might actually learn something about Korea. Yeah, this is Bill Gates, and I was born 523 of 1931 in Des Moines, Iowa. So, yes, any middle child would be like, that is exactly what it's like. The, the youngest one, which would be your Vietnam veterans, they were kind of the, you know, the naughty child, if you will. But it was one of the first ones that you guys mentioned not because people didn't know about it, but because it was such a passionate time in our nation's history. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the generation which is near and dear to my heart, not just because I'm a youngest child, but also because I feel that the Vietnam generation also is often misunderstood. And I have a passion for them because my dad was not in Vietnam. He graduated high school in 1972, but a lot of his friends were in Vietnam. My uncle was in Vietnam. And when I was going through my AIT out at Fort Meade, Maryland, I went to the Vietnam Wall for the first time, and that's when I picked up my POW bracelet, which if anyone uh, remembers, they were very popular during Vietnam. But this is from uh, Donald Sparks, who is still missing. Um, he was a POW and there's an entire story that goes on with him, but I've been wearing this since 1999. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been a little bit. But that's what brings me to talking a little bit about our Vietnam veterans. A very passionate time with a lot of things going on <coughs> between war protests. When they came home, they felt they were not welcome home. And a lot, I don't know if anyone has ever heard the term. Are there any veterans in here today? Okay. A lot of times when I see someone greeting a Vietnam veteran, what they say is welcome home. Because so often back then it went, it n was never said. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time right now talking about different Vietnam veterans who have impacted me greatly, not just in my personal life, but also in my career, where I'm going to let you internalize. This is another internalized question, but I had the honor of meeting a gentleman who had what he proclaims is the worst job but the best job. I think it's the worst job and he says it's the most important job in all the military. And once he explains what his job was when he was drafted, I think you will find it hard to disagree with him. We were the 506 Supply and Service Company Direct Support Memorial Act. I didn't mind your hug looking back, was probably the most important job that all the military. I mean, you take a loved one that's been killed. So it could be due to come. Thompson was their base, but it was just a little makeshift building off the side. It looked like it was like that inside of an airplane hangar. It held like 200, I don't know, 2, 250 bodies. Everybody went through there that was killed in Vietnam. For the two weeks I was there for training, we did 440 that I've seen all the death I can take. And we had, I think mean, there was four or five tables that we put them on. Open up the bag, cut the clothes off. It would take a skeleton chart and fill it out with where the were here, where it's missing. We'd shave them and give them a bath with a hose net, uh, and take them back into the mortations. Then we wailed them there. When they would embalm, they would embalm them right there. We did our best to be viewed. I mean, take 47s 
sent home in a body bag. That, you know, that, that to me is so disrespectful. They were sent home in a kind of forget. They were clean. They were, you know, to get the footlockers in. And I, I had a hard time with footlockers. And, and we had to go through everything and read everything. So the worst but most important job in all the military, if you guys can come up with another one, I would challenge you. So I originally met Roger Davidson. He works down at the Brass Armadillo, if anybody's been down there. And he said that he had a story to tell me. And of course, I love every story, but one, uh, there's a few reasons why his is so special to me. I was one of the first people he ever told his story to. 50 years later, why was I the one that he opened up to? There's a couple reasons and a couple theories. My, my first theory is maybe I just sat down and asked. Maybe I just said, hey, the floor is yours. Tell me whatever you want. Another thing is I can somewhat talk the talk. I know the difference between a soldier and a Marine. I know the difference between field artillery and infantry. I know the difference between CAV scouts and infantry scouts. All the things that are important to a veteran, I can talk that and be respectful. Many times when someone who's non-military tries to ask these questions, they may be very well intended, but they don't speak the right language. If you have someone speaking Spanish and someone speaking English, there's going to be a barrier. So when I speak veteran, that opens a lot of doors for me. So the rest of the story for Roger Davidson was, he said he was drafted. This is the only job that you can get, could get drafted into that you could say, no thank you, send me to the infantry instead. It's the only job that you could turn down. By the way, he was 19 years old when he was doing this job. Fresh out of high school. And he told me that he did a good job and he said he believes that other people should do a good job regardless of what your job is because you never know how important it is to someone else. That brings me to another Vietnam veteran who talks about doing a little bit more in his community. Uh, and I wholeheartedly believe that you don't have to be in the military or have a sad story to talk about what you can give back to your community. But his story involves earning his life, that he had a chance to live because other people that he served with did not have an opportunity to come home. So this is a gentleman that I interviewed as part of a documentary that I did on the Sioux City unit that deployed to Vietnam. The engineers had just completed two bunkers out of plywood and the walls were three foot thick and they put uh, gravel and rock and whatever they <coughs> put in those walls. But I was uh, assigned to uh, be on a bunker guard of bunker 13. How could a guy money to trade places? Because the body position I was going to be on was, was a pile of sandbags, probably sandbags. And I didn't consider that to be as safe as a brand new bunker. It was common knowledge then is that the, if you're on perimeter guard, you stand guard either on top or behind. Because RPGs would penetrate and then explode inside. Early in the morning, about three in the morning, there's four of us on, on for bunker. And one of the guys poked me. Did you hear that? And out in the distance, 
distance of the wire, we could hear in English, hey, G.I., are you awake? I was standing behind the bunker at that time, and they fired their RPG at our position. And I remember seeing it, it was like a ball of fire coming at me. Well, it hit sandbags in front of me. It wounded several of the guys that I was with, just knocked me down. The bunker I wanted to go to, where this window west then was, they were inside the bunker, all four of them. And they hit it with an RPG and all four were killed. I can't forget that because a guy I wanted to switch places with offered him money. It's a guy instead of me. Why did I survive? And maybe that's why I've, I've been involved so much with my community and, and doing different things. That jump. Um, you gotta do that extra. Because you were spared, you gotta do that extra. That is a very good question. Um, so there is a national archive of every video shot by Department of Defense. So back during World War II, my job was already a job, military journalism. And so everyone has access to these through the Library of Congress. It's archive.org is the website and you'll find tons of videos on any topic that you can think of. But I spend literally hours scouring to find just the right video to fit what they're talking about. And a lot of people take it for granted. They're like, oh, okay, of course you're talking about a bulldozer and I see a bulldozer. Do you know how long it takes to find a video of a bulldozer in Vietnam? They don't label it like that. But that comes... That one. Imagine, did that man didn't have a picture of it, did he? No, I'm no. Sure I actually no. Of the well, some of them do. Like if you're, if a lot of them would take their uh, Kodachrome or whatever back in the '60s, and then they would send it home, and then their moms would get it developed. He didn't take any videos of like bodies or anything, but he had pictures of himself, and that was a, a picture that he had of his building oh, that he was stationed at. Um, but, I mean, when I look back on my deployment photos, I mean, it's pictures of me doing my job or pictures of me and my friends. You, usually that's the kind of things that they give to me is, oh, uh, everyone has their service photo that has them with their cap on as they're going into basic training, that type of situation. But um, a lot of times it's just scattering the Internet. The historical video that goes with the um, the actual processing was real. Though. It was a training video that they did not have online because back during Vietnam they did not advertise that any of this stuff was happening so no one was allowed to shoot video in there except the people that were training the guys coming in. So I called the School for Mortuary Affairs. They had to look back through their reels actual 8 millimeter, 16 millimeter reels and find me, thank God for them, find me the historical video. So sometimes it's an adventure and if I try hard enough, I find it. Um, and sometimes uh, D-Day, I can find you a video on D-Day in a heartbeat. They covered that really well. Um, I guess I never thought about how the body came back to the a lot of people took it for granted that it was an actual team that was responsible to make sure that, and there is, uh, there's doctrine on how to do it properly. It's very specific. The part that always gets my heart when he's talking about processing the bodies, that he shaved them, mm -hmm. bathed them, made sure that they looked as good as possible when they were coming home. And they did come home in a bag. No. Nope. That's how I... Nope. Quite frankly, envision them to be in that yeah. box. Yeah. Um, like, they are ready for. Yes, that's yeah. And he said that was one of the big reasons why he wanted to do the interview is to disparage that rumor because that's what everybody it was a common saying back then. And but he said he um, 
he took pride in making sure that they could have an open casket uh, because it was found that that is the best kind of closure, like you can actually see them. You know it's really them. All right, well, I'm going to do one more video because I don't want you to think that the only thing I do is tell sad stories and make people cry and make my interviewees upset. But there was a gentleman that I met up at the veterans home and he's a World War II veteran and he said I'll do an interview with you as long as you let me play the piano for you so I needed to be his audience for a concert for a music concert and I said I'll let you play piano as long as you let me shoot video and so we made this deal we struck up a deal and so the video that I'm going to show you uh, next is about his life uh, during World War II um, and he talks, he mainly just wanted to talk about his life. He, ne he didn't get into details because it's not, to him, he didn't want to talk about the bad stuff. And I said, that's okay. You're here just to tell your story. I'm not here to pry information out of you. It's nice to not have an agenda. It makes my job so much easier to say, just tell me your story. It's yours. I'll help lead the way and say, oh, what happened next? But by no means do I sit down and know what this is going to look like. They tell me what their story is going to be. So I'm going to show you this vi video, and then like Paul Harvey, I'll tell you the rest of the story. I don't know, Robert. Said I was born October 14th, 1921.
Yes. So that's Robert Savaride. Um, he was one of the first videos that I produced this way where um, you know I make it into more of a story because obviously his story was so amazing I would you know not be doing any justice to him if I hadn't well so I you know a young eager business owner I said I'm gonna make this video I'm gonna put it on Facebook and put it up there and I wake up the next morning and it had like 10,000 views and I thought well man this is easy I could do this but the best part of it was he was a school teacher and his students started seeing the story and sharing it with his other students and sharing stories about him and talking about oh I remember when Mr. Savaride you know when I went graduated Waterloo High School and all those amazing details that for that moment he was alive in all of them and they could share this moment to remember his military history and to remember him as a teacher and I really thought to myself that I'm doing so much more than just making educational videos and telling stories I'm helping people be immortalized and live on I don't know if you've heard a saying that a person dies twice. It's an old proverb. A person dies twice. The first is when their soul leaves their body, and the second is when their name is spoken out loud for the last time. So in essence, I'm helping people live on through their stories. And that's, that's I'm done. There <laughs> Oh yes, um, it just depends on the school and the school year. Obviously, 2020 was not a good school year for any of us. But uh, I have talked at Johnston High School quite a bit. Uh, their French class, actually, they were doing lesson on World War II in France. Uh, so we, um, I visit them about that. I've gone. I've I travel all over the state of Iowa. So you guys are just lucky that you're in my own backyard. Um, but I've gone all the way as far east as Guttenberg, if you know where that is, as far north as George. Does anybody know where George, Iowa is? There's not much more up there except for South Dakota and Minnesota. I think those are the two. Um, so I love going to all these small towns. I am doing uh, veteran interviews at different libraries. So I let the library set it up and then I come in and conduct all the interviews and then they at their library have historical preservation of their local veterans. So that's a great thing that I like to do for them as well. Take it home and, try to get them well, and thank God there have been a lot of studies done recently on post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. Um, and that's, I also feel like I'm doing good work because some people, it's like a pop bottle that's shaken up and of course it's going to explode when you open it but once you get past that you can start healing they my mom is from that generation she graduated high school in 1968 but where she grew up you don't talk about it if something if anything bad happens you don't talk about it 50 years 75 years goes by and it's still just as raw as it was that first day because you never talked about it and so that's why there's, when soldiers come back from deployments now, there's a lot of therapy groups. And that's why uh, places that support groups, but also your VFW and your legions, it's a place for you to go and talk and say, oh, I'm not the only one who's having nightmares now. I'm not the only one who's maybe suffering from some sort of medical condition where you can have a group of people to talk to and it's not a perfect world we haven't fixed it by any means because the suicide rate is also astronomical but we're getting there as a society to say hey something happened to you let's let's recognize it so that we can help you even some of these gentlemen I talked to 75 years ago they are just now finding medications that can help them sleep and they're like I've, I don't know if I've ever slept without nightmares and they're finally able to do the research that they need to do to help them.